it's quite uh, evocative to be sitting here in what's the preview theatre at Elstree Studios, the original preview theatre, knowing that over 40 years ago, rushes of films were being brought in the next day for the directors and the actors to watch, uh, and knowing that this was used for Star Wars as well, back in 1976 when they were filming it, released in 1977. The fortunes of Hammer Films were probably very much replicating what was going on in the British film industry at the time anyway. Certainly here at Elstree, and, and Hammer Films had come here in about 66 or so. By the time it got to the end of the 60s, EMI took over the studios here. Things were tough. Things were very tough. Nationally, there was some strife, there were some union issues, there was three-day weeks, uh, and there were power cuts. And so the studios were in a very difficult position. They were making lots of low-budget films, but the power kept going, so they had to get generators in, which was fine to keep working. But what it meant was that the Hammer films that were the horror films um, had to be made on stages because they were period pieces. Hammer, at that stage, dipped their toe into comedy production as well, making the big screen versions of the small sitcom hits, like on the buses. And so the situation they were in was that Hammer, Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, they all got preference for the stage because it had to be historical. And Reg Varney and all the team from On The Buses every morning would get on a bus, cast, crew, lights and sound, drive up the road into another part of Boreham where there was a bit of light and had to film, which is why the On The Buses film in 1971 has so much on location locally because they had to film because the power was needed for Hammer's other films and the irony of being that On the Buses became the highest grossing film of 1971 it even beat Diamonds of Forever so there you go location worked but it was a difficult time uh, for the industry and the studios almost shut and almost closed in fact by the time it got to mid 1970s stages were closed and it meant that at that time there was a lot of worry for staff uh, and, and for production but it meant that, ironically, it helped part of the rebirth when George Lucas came along and was looking for stages and couldn't be accommodated in Pinewood. And actually, here at Elstree, we had mothballed a couple of hours. So we said, yeah, we've got stages. So it shows that the industry has its peaks and its troughs. Never get too worried about one particular period because hopefully something good will come along. And as a consequence of the difficulties in the early 70s, something very big did come along. And we ended up with Star Wars. And of course, we ended up with the first Indiana Jones trilogy as well. And Elstree was alive again. The Phoenix rose from the ashes. And from that, we remain ever busy. So we've had our difficult times. Uh, we've had hard times. And Peter Cushing would have experienced that on a day-to-day -day basis, being in a studios where there wasn't much money. And then thankfully, he was alive long enough to get involved in some of the big productions and see Elstree lift again. Uh, and, I, and I'm very grateful because I know, I know he'd be very proud of that. Here was a film that no one really wanted to make. Uh, they couldn't really find anywhere to make it. Pinewood was full. Pinewood didn't have enough space. Um, they came to Elstree, which had started to shut down stages because business wasn't very good and happened to have the space that they want. Uh, and the, George Lucas is bringing in actors to give it credibility and they're bringing in Alec Guinness, uh, and they're bringing in Peter Cushing, um, actors who probably didn't have an understanding of what it was about, uh, which, why would they? It's a new type of film. It's a new genre, if you like, for them. But they were established actors, and they were known in their fields. And to bring Peter Cushing in to play Grand Moff Tarkin, the commander of the Death Star, we look back now and we say, well, who else could it have been? At the, at the time, it could have well have been somebody else. It could have been Christopher Lee. But George Lucas wanted Peter Cushing. And I think that an actor will tell you that they perform a role over a 50-year period. Um, and some they think they'll be remembered for and some they don't want to be remembered for. And I don't think Peter Cushing had any idea when he turned up to Elstree in 1976, having been here for the five years previously making a variety of low-budget horror films, just what he would be remembered for. Because Christopher Lee, if you turn around and say to people, who was the best Dracula, who was the most famous Dracula, they'd automatically say Christopher Lee. But if you say Peter Cushing, they don't say Baron von Frankenstein. Um, they don't pick out an individual character because his, his, he, he, he was so diverse. But the fans will say Grand Moff Tarkin, Star Wars. He played his part in that first film to help give it the ambience and the professionality, if you like, and the skills of great actors to lift it. 
So much so that 40 years later, using CGI and an actor, they bring him back. And it was extraordinary when I went to see Rogue One in, in, uh, in the cinema. I saw it in America. And when Darth Vader came in and when Carrie Fisher's character, Princess Leia came in, my, my wife clapped. And my kids thinking, what? why is she clapping? Because they didn't understand it. It's like, yay, Darth Vader said, what are you doing? When uh, Grand Moff Tarkin was then in it, when Peter Cushing's image came up there, I had tears in my eyes because I loved Peter Cushing. And of course, it took me back to seeing the first film 40 years ago. And there's part of me that thinks knowing that Peter was a man of faith in the sense of he knew that one day he would be joined back together again in spirit with his wife who died in the 70s. I think there's a part of him that would be very happy and proud to know that his spirit lives on 40 years later. Not just with the fans from the 70s, but with a whole new, a whole new genre, not just a whole new group of fans, but a whole new generation of people. And I think there's part of that gives him immortality. And I think people like Peter deserved immortality because they were kind, honest, gentle actors who just wanted to do their best for the performance, for the industry, for everyone around them. And I think people like him should be remembered. <laughs>